uh, or sometimes direct realism. Realism, because it says you do really see the real world, at least some of the time. And it's naive because there's nothing else that gets between you and the real world. Sometimes it's called direct. Uh, to oppose it to, uh, to representative realism that says you never really see the real world. You just see pictures or representations of the real world that your mind constructs. Uh, now here's an odd fact. I think naive realism is obviously true. But as far as I can tell, none of the great philosophers of the, of the modern era, I don't know about the Greeks, but I doubt if they believed it either, but none of the great thinkers from Descartes on believed in naive realism. It's an amazing fact. Just about every crazy view is held by some famous philosopher or other. But here's what I think is a common sense, obvious truth. Uh, and that is, uh, if you go through the list, uh, Descartes, Locke, Barclay, Hume, Kant, Leibniz, Spinoza, and then it gets worse. Then you get all those Germans whose names start with H. <laughs> it's, just, it's awful. I mean, I, I can't tell you how horrible it is. But the problem is, nobody was a naive realist. And uh, I, I want to make my strongest claim at the beginning. I think the rejection of naive realism was the single greatest disaster uh, that happened in philosophy after Descartes. I mean, Descartes, Descartes gave us the mind-body mess, but he inherited that. That does go back to the Greeks. Uh, but the idea uh, that you can't ever perceive the real world, but only a picture in your mind, that creates a disaster because the question then arises, well, what's the relationship between the idea you do perceive or the sense datum or the impression that you do perceive and the real world? And there's no answer to that that's satisfactory once you make, once you make the decisive move of rejecting naive realism. And the rejection says, well, really, all you can ever see is this thing here uh, and the argument, I'll give you the argument in a minute. The argument says, because there's no way that naive realists can account for hallucinations and various kinds of perceptual delusions and illusions. So really, what you have to say is that all you can ever see is going on in here, and I'll put it out a little bit outside. So you can see the impression, and then the question arises, what's the relation between the impression that you do see, the impression, sense, data, idea, there's a different name for it, and the object that you don't see. And in Descartes and Locke, uh, the idea they have is that, well, the, the experience that you do see it resembles uh, the object, or at least it resembles it in some respects, the prim so-called primary quality. Uh, but then Barclay said correctly, uh, the notion of resemblance doesn't make any sense uh, because this side of the resemblance relation is absolutely invisible. And the guy says, I got two cars in the garage, they look exactly alike, but one of them is totally invisible. You know, you know he doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, if this part of the world is invisible, uh, then there's no way that it can look like this part of the world. Uh, and I won't rehearse the whole history of what happened then. Uh, I mean, Descartes and Locke said, okay, you see a picture of the real world. And Barclay said the picturing relation doesn't make any sense. But he didn't go back to naive realism. No, what he did was just get rid of all of that and say, well, all that uh, you can ever, all that the world consists of is minds and ideas. And then we're off and running. Then you've got Hume. Hume thought naive realism was such a dumb view that he didn't bother uh, to uh, take any time refuting it. He says, if you really are tempted, he didn't use this jargon, by the way. But he said, if you're really tempted to naive realism, just push one eyeball, and you'll find the world doubles. Well, the real world doesn't double, so naive realism must be false. That is such a bad argument. It embarrasses me. Hume was a great philosopher. But that's a terrible argument. I'll tell you what's wrong with it in a minute. <coughs> and then you might think, well, somebody's going to be a naive realist. But then the, one of the great disasters of all time occurred in Königsberg. The name is Immanuel Kant. Uh, and the reason it's such a disaster is he's so smart. I mean, he's so intelligent. But Kant then uh, tried, I can't even draw you a picture of Kant's views, because you can't draw a picture of the Ding on sich. Okay, what the hell does the Ding on sich look like? But you, I, I won't, well, I, 
I won't. I, I, there's not going to be a lecture about Kant, okay? I promise you. Okay, so let's figure out what's going on. How did these guys get in this mess? And I'm going to say they got in the mess by neglecting the intentionality of perception. And I'm going to explain the intentionality of perception in some detail. Now, let me say, uh, by one word of qualification, like most philosophers, I'll talk mostly about vision. Uh, the account uh, would have to apply to other perceptual modalities, but most of our information uh, about the world comes from vision. So vision is not a bad place to concentrate on, even though, of course, we want to recognize that there are other perceptual <coughs> modalities. The whole argument against naive realism Indeed, all of the variations on this argument, I think, depend on a simple fallacy. And I'm now going to expose the fallacy. The simplest argument against naive realism is this. Suppose that this guy who thinks he sees this object is having a hallucination. Now, I can't tell you how hallucinations loom large in Western philosophy as if it's the most ordinary thing in the world to have a hallucination. I've never had a hallucination. Uh, even Czech beer doesn't give me hallucinations. Um, but uh, uh, philosophers talk as if, oh, hallucination, you got, got to watch out. You might be having hallucinations. Okay, but here's the point. The story goes as follows. Suppose the guy's having a hallucination. Well, in the case of the hallucination, all the same, he's aware of something. He does perceive something. Maybe not a real material object, but he does perceive something. But now, since the perception is indistinguishable from the so-called veridical case, veridical is one of those ugly words that makes you think you know what you're talking about. But anyway, that means the real thing, the non-delusory case. Since the perception in the hallucination case is indistinguishable from the veridical case, we have to give the same analysis of both. But if in the hallucinatory case, the guy doesn't see the material object, but only what? Well, his own experience, his own sense datum, his own impression, as Hume would say, or his own idea, would say, as Descartes would say. Then you have to say that in every case. You have to say that um, if you don't see the material object in the hallucination case, then you don't see it in any case because the indistinguishability of the perceptual phenomena requires us to give the same analysis of each case. Okay, has anybody got that argument? Because there are lots of variations on that argument. And I won't go through all of them. There's the bent stick and the elliptical coin and all those. Austin, my old teacher in philosophy, wrote a wonderful little book. It's a series of lectures called Sense and Sensibilia. And you might want to go through that because he takes all these arguments apart. But I want to say there's a simple mistake that they all rest on. They rest on a simple fallacy. What looks like the obvious point that they nobody can deny is in fact fatally ambiguous. The point they think nobody can deny is this. In the case of a hallucination, the guy does see something. Or if it's not see, maybe see is too big of a verb there. All the same, he's aware of something. So let's use that one. Let's say he's aware of something. So in the veridical case, he's aware of a material object. And in the hallucinatory, hallucinatory case, he's aware of something, a sense datum. So I think I'm seeing a material object, a cup, but if it's a hallucination, all the same, I'm aware of something. And the idea is then... Since the two experiences are indistinguishable, you have to give the same analysis of each. Okay, the fatal ambiguity is this. The phrase aware of, conscious of, and even perceive, as it's used in these contexts, is fatally ambiguous between two different senses. One sense is intentionalistic. I haven't told you what that word means yet, but I will in a minute. Where it means it's about objects and states of affairs in the world. And the other sense is constitutive. So I am aware, to say I am aware of something in the hallucinatory case is ambiguous between an awareness of the something where the something is identical with the awareness itself.